Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the Crypto News Podcast. We're buzzing as always. And today we have Thomas Kralau on the show. He is buzzing. He's coming in nine hours ahead of us in the beautiful East Coast of North America. He is in Dubai, where everyone in crypto seems to be. Thomas is a financial markets expert, influencer, mentor, and entrepreneur behind University Grade Trading Education, an accredited trading learning program that offers the necessary tools to become a consistent trader or investor. Thomas has been in the space for a hot minute and provides incredible analysis for anyone looking to just get in and learn a little or become a true expert. Thomas, super pumped to have you on. Welcome to the show, my friend. Excited to be here. Thank you, Matt. Let's jump right into the bread and butter of crypto, and that is Bitcoin. You provide tons of analysis on Bitcoin, which I absolutely love. We've been in this stagnant spot for quite some time. By the time this episode airs, it's going to be end of February and end of February 2023. Bitcoin's been hovering between what, 20 and 25 for the last month or so. Before that, we got down to 16 at one point. Last year, we were in heaven at 69. What do we have to look forward to? Walk me through the whole nine yards. What's going on? What are some of the sort of technical indicators? What about the macro events? Give me your whole sort of 360 degree spiel on current present day Bitcoin. I think that right now actually is an incredible moment in the history of Bitcoin in general. I think that a lot of people underestimate as to how important the current probably next few weeks or and few months as well, because uh, as though a lot of people are looking at the price right now, they see that we're standing at $25,000 and they just don't give it that much importance. But quite frankly, there are so many interesting aspects. If we look at macro events, if we look at on-chain data, if we look at pure technicals, everything is kind of tell us, is telling us the same thing, that we've bottomed out and we potentially are just starting, just being this beginning of this bull market, the next one, except for the macro environment, this is a bit iffy. But every single on-chain indicator is just screaming bottom buy with all you've got, so to speak. If we take a look at technicals, then certainly the $25,000 mark where we have the crossovers of 200 moving average and 50 moving average in uh, the weekly chart, where we have this death cross, which actually a lot of people think it's very bullish. But for me, just technically for us to actually confirm any kind of a you know, reversal. Technically, we really want to close above 25K. So I think in this instance right now, the most important level for us and the important, most important event is stabilizing above 25,000 because I think we're going to see a lot of liquidations if we're going to go past 25K. And certainly this is also going to confirm the very important narrative of us seeing a slight but decoupling from other risk on assets. If we're going to see S&P 500, Bitcoin is going up and currently still as we speak retesting 25K. And for me, it's like so exciting because we're seeing huge squeezing to 25K while S&P is going down right now. So the same, if we're going to take a look at Dixie, which just notoriously, whenever Dixie is going up, Bitcoin is going down. So it's inverse correlation. But these past days and I think a week or so, we're actually seeing decoupling. It could be because of the BU as DFAT, it could be because of China and this quantitative easing in China and hopium scenarios and just in general market being too overdue for a relief rally. But I think that if this is sustained and if we're actually going to close above 25K and we don't close this gap between all the high-risk assets and Bitcoin, this could really be overriding everything that could potentially be down the road in terms of macro, which is the potential for a recession because we are still not out of the woods with inflation. Fed cannot really be very happy with what we are seeing with CPI even though a lot of, because I shorted Bitcoin at CPI reading, the previous one. So that, I mean the latest one. And it came in, it was supposed to come in at uh, 6.2, the expectation of the market. It was previously 6.5. It came in at 6.4. This is really bad. I mean, we had better readings on CPI when Bitcoin actually crashed on those readings. So it was enough for high-risk assets to actually tumble. But it was not the case. We actually pumped, so I actually got stopped out. Well, but in this instance, it just shows me how much power there is and the desire in the asset to move. I just hope that it's going to be sustained. That's all. Well said there. A couple a couple points. You kept referring to the key indicator at 25k USD. Is that more on the sort of that there's just a whole bunch of cell walls there is there some type of technical analysis there or is that strictly like a psychological barrier where 
if the general population believes, and obviously the pros and everyone, just everyone within the space believes that once yeah. we pass 25K, it's sort of clear skies ahead. Okay, so certainly it's not clear skies ahead. There is going to be a lot of other so-called order blocks on the way. It's even going to be the biggest psychological level, I think, uh, besides 25K is going to be even 30K because it was previously very important. It was a floor for us when we had this Chinese FUD. So it's all about the order blocks. But right now, the most important one, in my opinion, is 25K, just, just technically, because we had a confirmation. It was actually created back in May of 2022, as I'm looking at the chart right now. And then it was confirmed that we retested it. So we actually kind of made it into a resistance from support. And that was confirmed in August of last year. And right now we're testing it. So this would be this level that just technically by all these models and patterns would constitute a true change from a downtrend into an uptrend. And again, it also coincides just spot on with the death cross of the weekly chart of 200 moving average and 50 moving average. So it's like standing, it's like triple trouble in terms of resistance right at, at 25K. Plus it also being just a round number, which also is significant, yeah. For sure, for sure. That's, uh, wow, crazy. I really hope we get to that 25, of course we all do. Um, another really interesting point you just brought up is the importance of the Chinese market. Now, Chinese New Year. I know you have a couple hot takes on this and I absolutely love these when I was doing research for the show, but does the Chinese New Year, does that give us any hope for a bull run? In any in any regard, because again, I've when I was going over all the show notes and doing my research, you had some really interesting hot takes on this, and I think a couple of them could could really be true. You know, see, the thing is that traders oftentimes trying to draw a lot of very deep parallels with different events in the market and as to what they're seeing in the price. And especially the technical traders, when they're start, starting to see some kind of a pattern or coincidence in the price action between certain events like Chinese New Year, certainly there are impacts. Like, I mean, the New Year season and the holiday season in the United States or 4th of July or any day that the market is off, for example, and the S&P doesn't move and us being correlated to S&P certainly is going to have an effect. So the same thing, right. you know, the same kind of small values can be attributed also to the Chinese New Year. However, honestly, even though maybe I used to be a huge believer of these kinds of coincidences, I stopped believing these. Only why? I'll tell you why. Because I just refer, and this is what I also teach my students and not just in general friends and people that ask me these questions, that I focus on what is of utmost importance. And of utmost importance, it's not Chinese New Year just as a fact of itself, in my opinion. I think that it's more important in terms of the monetary policy of China, of geopolitics, of monetary policy of the United States, of Federal Reserve, of WEF, what WEF wants to do, and so many other things that, you know, it's like, I think it's just attributing value to something that is not that relevant, in my opinion. Interesting. Very, very interesting, Thomas. Another thing that I really want to discuss, and I know all of our listeners are incredibly curious about, is the decoupling of the traditional equities and traditional securities narrative. You brought this up in the first two minutes of the pod. Personally, I think this is one of the biggest sort of humps that we have to get over. There's such a, we failed the narrative that risk that, that Bitcoin was an asset that allowed us to sort of get away from the traditional markets. When the traditional markets went and went to shit, Bitcoin was the safe haven. Turned out that was not the thing at all. It was also supposedly a hedge for inflation. That also turned out to be not true. How important is it and what will happen if we ever actually decouple from traditional equities and become that sort of safe haven, risk on asset? See, everything is it's a great question. Everything is very cyclical. And I think it's all like, if you believe in energy, and as Michael Saylor has many times pointed out, that Bitcoin is the highest frequency energy in a sense, and that perception of people of this asset has profound effects on its correlations to other assets. Because if a certain narratives and characteristics fall in line with certain belief systems. But just to answer your question in a very simple way, I would say that Bitcoin in general, well, as you know, you actually said that, you know, uh, Bitcoin was terrible hedge against inflation. It really depends on the time horizon that we should look at. Actually, Bitcoin is a better hedge against inflation than gold. If you look at the four year time horizon or eight year time horizon. If you look at two year time horizon, then actually it's the same as gold pretty much. So it really depends on how you look at it. So, but in my opinion, what is the biggest answer here overall is 
the development of the industry, which really, even though a lot of people who have been into crypto, a lot of people are relatively young. I'm young, you're young. And we kind of, for us, a five-year time period is a lot of freaking time. You know, it seems like eternity. But if we look at other risk, uh, other assets in general really good point. in history, yeah. I mean, yeah, it's like it's nothing. It's like 20, 10 years, 14 years, whatever. It means no, it doesn't matter. What we have to look at is at the performance of an asset within the next 50 to 100 years, and then we'll be able to actually tell. And I think that by then, and I'm going back to this life's energy spiral and just how it works in general, I think that in gen in the beginning, it wasn't correlated. But that then it became correlated simply because we had so many institutionals uh, coming in with the big money and the smart money. Uh, and certainly, they were treating it as just high-risk asset, highly speculative, and something that, you know, if they're going to be selling it off out of their portfolio, this is going to be the first thing to go. So that's why, you know, it was oftentimes Bitcoin price could actually be forward-looking because this would be the first thing to dump out of a portfolio. But I think that with time, as the world starts to realize and all the big powers behind certain agencies and governments, etc., and especially all the big corporations like, you know, we already see with Fidelity and BlackRock, etc., once we see uh, their narrative to start shifting from just a fun, speculative thing that people kind of want, so it's kind of cool marketing for us to have if we're an asset manager. Uh, once it actually shifts to profound understanding of the deep value of the asset, which is true proprietary rights, which is the real scarcity, something that cannot be diluted. So once actually Bitcoin is going to hit this cherry, you know, like hit this spot of what it actually is, it is going to decouple. I mean, it has to, because it, it cannot be, it's not a stock, it's not a commodity, it's not a currency, it's actually all of these things in one. It's a brand new asset class. And the market hasn't realized it yet, that therefore we have this kind of a, uh, I mean, uh, this kind of a correlation. I mean, if the market would finally start pricing in the reality, which for some legal reasons, maybe it's not possible for the time being, but once it starts pricing this in, I mean, then we will just decouple from everything because Bitcoin, in my opinion, I don't want to sound like a Bitcoin maxi, but it just is the most superior asset, in my opinion, in the human history. So it has to pre pre perform better than anything else out there. So just my two cents on this. Thomas, where do you think we are in regards to the market as a whole? Are we still in bear territory? Are we in sort of that leeway period? Do we, you know, we've gone up, what, 6K in the last mm, six weeks? Obviously, that's great to have. Yeah. Are we are we in bull market territory yet? Do we still have a lot of pain to go? Give me your sort of like six and six, 12, maybe 18 month hypothesis. Uh, I think that if, uh, I think that the worst of it is behind us. Meaning that uh, if you just analyze as per what, could, what worse could happen, the worst thing really that could happen is the recession. So that's why I think that the wheel is in the hands of Jerome Powell, unless we just, you know, give so much weight to the current small decoupling that we are saying. So in general, if we just be very responsible investors, then we can for sure say that with the current inflation readings and what Fed is actually projecting themselves, the chances of this being the end of it or at best 50-50. So I would say that, you know, once the, when the, whenever this podcast comes out, if it's after the February 24th, then I think that uh, people can actually check what was the PCE outcome. Because right now, I think that the forecast, uh, I'm forgetting what the, the forecast for PCE, I think it was the drop of, uh, let me just quickly find it, was a drop of from 4.3, I think, all the way down to, now from 4.4 down the forecast currently at 4.3. Because if it's going to come in and PCE is a primary gauge for inflation for Fed and Powell. So if, if it's going to come in at 4.4, which is going to confirm the bad side of things that I actually discussed in the beginning about CPI and inflation. And this is just going to mean that inflation is sticky and we are very far away from 2% target of Fed. And either they're going to have to accept 3% or something and sticky inflation, or they're going to just over tighten. And we're certainly going to have more rate hikes than anticipated by the market and that what the market has priced in. And then the worst part of this all, why I'm just going on the monologue here, is that if we're going to see this kind of a uncontrollable inflation, which is you could call stagflation, then I'm pretty sure Bitcoin is going to show us sub $10,000 mark. So it all really depends on the upcoming inflation readings, in my opinion. This is what, I mean, 
if it all comes in fine and we just keep seeing this, this reduction, then this is certainly the beginning of the next bull market. This is going to be this beginning of this small bear market rally, which leads us always into halving into 2024. And then the supply shock with the halving and the reduction of the uh, reward for the miners and booyah, we have this explosion in the next bull market. So this could be the beginning. But again, every time when you're looking at indicators, you have to keep it in the back of your mind that what is the driver right now? Because every time when the indicator was flashing the bottom, the macro environment was very different from what it is today. And today it's quite shitty. So that's that's my short take on this. 100%. Walk me through the day in the life of a trader. You've been doing this for a hot minute. You're clearly very switched on. You know all of the technical analysis, all of the key indicators that you need to look for. Every young, it appears males more than females, guys more than girls, dream of being traders but you know when you're younger and you get that first positive trade and you and you return a little bit of alpha it's very addicting you get that crazy dopamine hit you get the adrenaline you think you can do it time after time after time and then people always go down sort of the you know the the classic penny stocks and day trading and perhaps currency and then crypto whatever the case may be but having a routine is paramount to success in trading every good trader i know keeps a journal or a log or an excel sheet of absolutely everything Obviously, they've done thousands of hours of homework, but I'd love to be, sort of walk through your daily routine. You know, when do you wake up? When do you check the markets? What, when do you eat? Do you work out? Like walk me through everything just to sort of let people know what it takes to truly become a pretty darn successful trader. Also, a fantastic question. I'm just going to try to summarize this somehow without a two-hour rant on to how, what I usually do. I mean, it all starts with number one, it's all about mindset and it's not about, you know, just believing in something. It's mindset in terms of ha having a clear mind. And it also has uh, this metaphysical, you know, like for example, you doing affirmations and just making yourself believe that you can actually make money and actually be systematic. And it's, it's one side of things. So it's like affirmations, visualizations, meditations. I do meditations once a day minimum, sometimes three times a day just to calm my mind. Then besides this, it's also substances. I used to be an alcohol abuser. I used to drink a lot. It was like, I mean, I'm 28 now, but it was back in the day when I was like 20, 21, 22. And I was, I mean, that's when I was really getting into trading, making my first money. And, you know, quite frankly, it doesn't help when you're hungover or whenever you're not 100%. So it just, even small effects, even though people sometimes don't feel these effects, can actually pile up one on top of the other, which leads to overtrading, revenge trading, and just blowing up your account. So certainly, it is, no, I haven't had a single beer for six years. So I don't smoke, I don't drink, I don't do drugs, I don't hang out with idiots. So it's yeah, like... That's, that's incredible. But th this is like the very beginning. This is the foundation. Besides this workout, I mean, certainly, of course, I have to work out because I have to keep my body in shape just to feel good about myself. And just in general, good health equates you know, lower heart rate, lower blood pressure, and just overall, you know, especially good food. It's just, so this is all just basic stuff just to keep yourself fit. And it actually affects your brain capacity as well because you're just more sharp. But when it comes to my day routine, daily routine, one, the biggest thing that helps me being, you know, especially when I was doing a lot of active trading, not right now I moved on to asset management. I own two funds. I have a hedge fund, a venture fund where we invest in early stages of crypto projects. I also own a real estate company. I own three more other companies, educational company. I invest into other companies. So we do so many things. So, and also do active trading. But when I was like a uh, super active trading, like when I was doing just day trading, which was one of the craziest times of my life, quite frankly, then the most important aspect was information. And my intake, and it still is the same, but it's just the intake of information on a daily basis is like crazy. I mean, you know, people go to the university and they study for a couple of years. I probably take in more information per week than people take in per semester at the university, <laughs> listening to podcasts, watching videos, reading reports, uh, communicating with people, gathering information for what? To understand the market sentiment. To understand what do retailers think. I have friends in Goldman Sachs. I constantly communicate with them. I read reports from uh, JP Morgan, Goldman Sachs. It's, it's uh, just to keep myself educated. What do these people think? What does the market think? What do people on Twitter tweet? You know, like what is the narrative? 
what is like you you have to always be on your toes as a trader i mean unless you're like a technical trader which is quite difficult in the bear market so whenever it's a bull market then you can just you know take patterns wedges squeezings maybe add level two market data and the order flow and you're gonna be good to go because it's all one direction but if it's a bear market you know or you know like consolidate it's, it can be quite tough so here you have to incorporate also macro on chain if it's crypto fundamentals if it's stocks so and technicals so there's so many things you have to pay attention to so the biggest and the best tip is to stay sober stay fit and mega focused and take in as much information as, because people are lazy, man. They're so lazy. They 100%. don't do research. They just go out, they just place a few lines on a chart and they kind of want to, you know, trade a false break or some shit, you know? And at the end of the day, I mean, this is at the end, I mean, I also trade false breaks, true breaks, whatever. But my choosing of a trade can be there has there can be so much information behind it. It's unbelievable. And it's ongoing. You cannot lose track of it. Folks, we got to take a quick break and give a huge shout out to our new sponsor of the show, and that is Undead Metaverse. This podcast is brought to you by Undead Metaverse, the ultimate gaming experience with Undeads, a post-apocalyptic world with an above-the-ground city for humans and underground layers for zombies, all powered by blockchain technology. This unique game is designed to blend top-level mechanics with play-to-earn rewards, Undead's Metaverse has over 5 million already invested and is making waves, giving a ton back to the community. The game is led by Leo Khan, former PayPal executive, and Ash Hodgetts, former CMO of Animoca Brands Phantom Galaxy's game. Undead's has also secured partnerships with top industry players such as Warner Bros, Wabi Sabi Sound, and many more to come. Enjoy a incredible feature-rich gameplay, a VR experience, and a healthy and efficient game economy verified by machinations.io. Join the conversation at undeads.com and sign up for the whitelist now. And now back to the show with Thomas. Thomas, you just gave us some crazy alpha about what it takes to become a good trader and switched on. We love to see that. I'd love if you could walk us through some of the key sort of technical analysis or just more quantitative points to look for as a trader. When I remember when I got into the game, you had the famous teacup, you had the head and shoulders, you had the 180 day moving average, you had the death cross. Are there any that you look forward to when perhaps you see this technical indicator, you're like, I need to hammer this home or do the opposite and short the shit out of it. Give us the whole spiel on technical analysis. Uh, quite frankly, you know, I, it's, a lot of people ask me this question as to which patterns do I personally prefer to trade and like what's my most favorite one. And I always give the answer that people don't expect because they always expect, you know, something that, as you're saying, that uh, cup and handle or something, a uh, wedge. It certainly is wedges and squeezing formations and flags and just horizontal levels, diagonal levels. My personal favorites have always been horizontal and diagonal levels in general. But quite honestly, um, I will just uh, hijack this a bit and just answer it in a bit of a different way. I think that it's not as important as to which pattern you select. It's more important as to how you treat it. And you actually touched upon this before, and it's about the journal. Uh, a lot of people, and I just wanted to use this opportunity to emphasize the importance of it. Because if you just select any kind of a pattern from this general book, and you trade these patterns, and you don't record your statistics, and you don't keep the journal, trust me, you're going to fail. I mean, it maybe a bit sounds a bit weird, whatever, and people are going to scream saying that, oh, Thomas, I've been trading for a whole two weeks and I've made money. In reality, uh, there are so many rules, so many technicalities uh, when it comes to not just the patterns themselves, but also stuff that surrounds trading, which is actually sometimes more important than trading itself. A pattern is not difficult to spot. What is difficult to spot is actually how to trade it, meaning that with proper risk and money management, how do you evaluate ATR? which is also very important, which is average true range. A lot of people, they trade, they do day trading. And for example, ATR on Bitcoin or any industry, let's say ATR is $500. So an instrument on average moves $500. They place a stop of 
700 bucks and they want to take another one to one also 700 bucks which is just stupid it's stupid number one because of one on one one to one is very difficult because then if you you have to be right at least 50 percent of the time which is very difficult to achieve like my personal average was like 45 percent 40 percent 47 percent rarely above 50 percent in a short-term perspective it can be a hundred percent but if you if you want to be a trader with a track record of 10 years then you're going to see that your success rate is going to be very far from 50 percent on average, especially on active trader. So that's why you have to be taking three to one, maybe two to one, four to one. Some of my trades are 20 to one. So I can screw it up 20 times in a row to break even. Just one trade is going to pull me out. So this being said, uh, when, you, when you're selecting a pattern, it's like, I mean, for me, it's like the last thing. The first thing for me is actually how do I read the market? Because I cannot trade against the market. It's not just about the trends. Trend is very basic stuff. It's trading against the market. It's trading against the market's statistics. What's the current range? When is, where is your next resistance? People sometimes just take a trade of a false break or a breakout of the wedge and they disregard everything else. Then the price turns on them, they get stopped out and they wonder. So that's number one. And number two is statistics. Biggest thing, trust me, like I have thousands of students globally. I've been a coach for like three, four years now. I have probably 10,000, more than 10,000 students these days. So for them, Whenever I give them proper way of keeping their statistics, and there is like 15 metrics that they have to record in their trading, in their uh, after every trade, like ATR range, time frame, like I mean, this shit ton of stuff. And at the end of, for example, 200 trades, they see precisely which pattern works, which doesn't work, which time frame they're better at, which sometimes some people keep losing money on Fridays because they're so eager to go drink beer with their friends or I don't know, whatever, whatever it is. And you have to I see these that. things. You remove Fridays, you you don't trade after 2 p.m. because you see you, you screw up after maybe you screw up around the news time, you have to see this. And in order to see this, you need to keep proper statistics. And oftentimes, it can swing you, like it can improve your performance by five to 10%, which is not much, but trust me, five to 10% is freaking life changing and oh, can make up. a losing trader into, into an actually uh, winning trader. So this is more important, in my opinion, than any pattern. I love that advice about keeping track of absolutely everything. That's just, it just seems such a no brainer, but I can tell no one does that. Uh, Thomas, you gotta, I, I know we're getting a little tight for time here. You gotta plug your course before we go. That there's just so much alpha in the course, university grade trading education. I'm sure you teach a lot about what you've dropped in this pod, but tell me a little bit about the course and what you and the team do and how you provide value for your students and your community. Our main objective really at tomscroll.com is really to bring this universal education that is, uni why is it called university grade? Well, number one, we're certified and accredited by CPD in the UK. That's number one. And number two, we actually issue a certified diploma. And we also have an average like grades, it's a US grading system, which is GPA. We have 85 practical assignments, which are graded. We also have a final exam. We have tests. So it's like serious, like almost like, a semester at the university because it takes about five months to complete it. And the person learns everything like from Forex, which I don't really personally like, but they learn Forex, stocks, crypto, uh, futures, indices, uh, everything except for the option strategies. I never liked options, so I'm not an expert on option strategies. So besides this, they learn day trading, uh, scope trading for like super active trading if they want to. Um, they learn long-term investing and portfolio building. And so literally every, a fundamental analysis on chain. So everything you can possibly imagine you're learning. Because in my opinion, even if you want to be a day trader, it doesn't really, you don't have to understand how Warren Buffett puts together his portfolio. But trust me, it could be, can be quite useful because you could understand which asset could potentially pump and why. And you can, ident you can actually evaluate the potential for a certain company, which you, for example, are trying to day trade. So it is still useful. Same thing if you're an investor and you don't need to learn day trading, but not really. I mean, when you are an investor and, and a day trader, for your long-term portfolio, you can pick a better technical entry for your long-term position and control it. Understand where to put the stop, understand where somebody else might have a stop, where there could be a liquidity grab. So you control stuff that you do. So this is what we teach. We teach everything from A to Z. 
And there is also option for VIP mentorship, which I take in usually like 10 to 15 people a year, where it's like super exclusive, super VIP. And it's also uh, an option where I literally guide people through the whole process. But it's like, it's a serious piece of education. And in my, I spend like a year developing it. It's not one of those get rich quick schemes where we just say, oh, use this magic strategy and become a Forex millionaire. This is just not true. You know, we're as straightforward as it gets. So that's pretty much it. Hey, thanks for the plug. Love that. Lastly, Thomas, before we let you go, we got to jump in the hot take factory. You got to give me a couple hot takes before you leave us today. What are a couple things that only Thomas believes in, whereas most other people do not? It doesn't have to be crypto or financial, whatever related. It can be absolutely anything, health, wealth, happiness, politics, sports, food, space, AR, AI, VR, you name it. Give me a couple Thomas hot takes before we leave. There's probably two things really. Uh, I think that a lot of people think that money is the most important thing and that the money is going to make them happy. And that's why a lot of people go into trading uh, just to make themselves happy, thinking that money is going to make them happy. In some instance, maybe some people are lucky that something as simple as money makes them happy. But for me, I, like, I made many mistakes in my life and I always suggest to people to focus on what makes them happy. And if trading, isn't, if trading really pisses you off and makes you miserable, it's not for you because the money you're going to get from it is not going to really make you happy either. This is number one. So always have to pursue, I guess a lot of people say like Jeff Bezos and whoever, you know, these billionaires, they always say, do what you love. It sounds so cliche. But man, it's life changing. Because as soon as I started like doing more what I love, and like I actually became a passion trading, and actually followed this vision as to do what you love, and it just by coincidence was trading. So it was an incredible. Because we, after all, we're not after money in life. We're after the life itself and the pleasure and the joy. So every moment that you spend in happiness is more valuable than a billion dollars. This is my first belief that just first just came to my mind. And second one is that Bitcoin is going to certainly reach a million dollars. Uh, well, probably within 10 years or so, but it will certainly reach 10 million. So I keep accumulating and collecting Bitcoin. Love that. Thomas, thank you so much, man. Before we let you go, can you please let our listeners know where they can find you and your course, university grade trading education online and on socials? Yeah, for sure. So uh, our main website for uh, my university, it's thomaskralo.com. And certainly I am very active on Instagram, but Instagram is more fun and showing off. So if that's what people want to see, then that's where I do a lot of fun reels. We get like millions of views with fun stuff. But if you guys, if the guys are interested in something serious and educational, then that's YouTube and also Twitter, but mostly YouTube. And certainly I'm also, since I'm on Instagram, I'm also on TikTok and LinkedIn, but mostly I would say if people really want to get a taste for what I do and how I do it, then it's Instagram, uh, Twitter, and YouTube. And it's just Thomas Kralo on everything, right? Yeah, it's just Thomas Kralo. It's all the same everywhere. Amazing. Thomas, thank you so much, man. You dropped a shit ton of alpha on this pod. Greatly appreciate it. And I'm sure the listeners will, our listeners will absolutely love this. Appreciate you coming on. Um, and I can't wait for round two in the next couple months. Thanks, Matt. Happy to be here. And thank you very much for the invitation. Folks, what an episode with Thomas Kralau. He dropped a crazy amount of alpha for us. You want to become a trader, an asset manager, or just learn a little bit more about traditional markets and crypto. This episode had it all for you. As always, I will include everything in the show notes. Huge shout out to Thomas and the team for helping get this set up. To my team, thank you so much, guys, for everything. As always, could not do this without you. To you, Stas, my amazing editor, appreciate you, man. As always, and to the listeners, love you guys. Thank you so much for everything. And keep on growing those bags and keep on staying healthy, wealthy, and happy. Bye for now, and we'll talk soon.